Um, hi, I'm Jonathan Wolf. I'm co-founder and CEO of Zoe, and welcome to our first Zoe podcast-style video. Today, we want to discuss a new Zoe science paper that's been peer-reviewed and published in Nature Metabolism today, uh, and it's discussing blood sugar, hunger, and calories. The paper has some pretty fascinating discoveries. Do you have big blood, blood sugar dips or little ones? Are you eating food that actually makes you hungrier? Could you lose weight without reducing calories by swapping the food you eat for something else? We will examine this and much more with my two wonderful guests. Uh, first up is Anna Valdez. Anna is a professor at the University of Nottingham and is the lead author on this paper in Nature Metabolism. Anna grew up in Mexico. She studied at the University of California, Berkeley, and then moved to the UK, where she's been collaborating on studies of twins with Zoe's own Professor Tim Spector for many years. Anna's focus is how molecular mechanisms impact metabolic health. And Anna has been part of Zoe's scientific advisory board for almost four years, so, so part of the family. My other guest is Will, Dr. Will Bolsovich, which is a hard thing to say, as Will knows, which is why we call him Dr. Will. He's a practicing gastroenterologist, He's internationally recognized as a gut health expert, and he's the New York Times bestselling author of the book Fiber Fueled. He is also the newest member of Zoe's Scientific Advisory Board. Welcome, Will. Thank you, Jonathan. Excited to be here. I'm excited to dig into this exciting science that Dr. Anna has um, just published in, in Nature Metabolism. And I think that many of the popular ideas surrounding blood sugar people are going to be very surprised at the science and how it's going to change the way that you think about your blood sugar. So I think people are going to be uh, quite shocked by what they're about to hear over the next 40 minutes or so. Brilliant. Well, I think let, let's get started. Um, but maybe, you know, Anna, you know, some of our audience might be cutting edge scientists, others of them uh, are just interested listeners. So maybe you could just start by explaining like what is blood sugar and why is blood sugar important before we start to talk about the new discoveries uh, in the paper you've published today. Sure, thank you very much for that very nice introduction, Jonathan. So blood sugar is, when, when we eat, we eat, everything can be divided into three things, proteins, fats, or carbs, carbohydrates. And these things are not going to have any impact. Uh, so if proteins are going to be uh, broken down into amino acids, these are going to be building blocks for our cells and for our muscles and things like that. Fats all are going to be broken down and are going to go into our blood. And that's a complete other topic of how that ends up in, uh, in energy. And the other form of energy is, of course, our carbohydrates. They break down into sugar, and that sugar goes into our blood. That's the blood glucose. So why do we measure blood glucose, which is what's going to be feeding energy to our cells, to our muscles, to our heart, to our, to our brains, is that it's going to go up when we eat something that has carbohydrate in it, and then it's going to go down. If it goes very high, for, for instance, in people with diabetes, that could be quite risky. And having very high High glucose after a meal is not a good thing as we have done in in other studies and as many people have shown that can relate to your heart disease your heart risk and, and uh, the risk of diabetes aging and a bunch of other things but then what happens after it goes up it eventually goes down and what we're looking in this paper is what happens when it goes down and how does that relate to how hungry you're going to be feeling and how much are you going to be eating after after that meal, three, four hours after the meal, maybe the whole day after that meal, does that have an impact on how much you eat? So that is what we looked at in this study. And I, I just would like to jump in for a quick moment, Jonathan, and connect with the listeners at home who are hearing about the importance of blood sugar, because I think that many times it's so, it's so easy uh, on the internet, on social media for people to vilify carbohydrates, vilify blood sugar, make it sound like blood sugar is the enemy. Yet blood sugar is a necessary part of human life. And it is the source of energy that that um, flows through our blood and that supports our brain and is the fuel that our brain uses, which is one of the concepts that we're going to be talking about in just a moment with regards to the findings that Dr. Anna and the Zoe team have with this paper. And so it's not that blood sugar is a problem. Blood sugar is a part of life. The problem is when the blood sugar is moving in directions that are out of control and whipping up and whipping down. And that's really what we're going to be talking about here. 
It's fantastic, Will. So, so the message is blood sugar isn't bad. Blood sugar is essential. It's, as Anna said, along with blood fats, the two things that uh, you know, provide energy. And the question is what's going on and how does it impact the way we feel in this environment that we live in in the 21st century, which is obviously very different from the environment in which we all evolved. So, um, Anna, can you tell us a little bit about this Predict One study that's provided the data that you've then um, used? You know, tell us a bit about it. Why is it interesting? What's different about it from uh, things that have been done over, you know, like a hundred years, I guess, in terms of blood sugar? So, Predict is a really, really cool study that was run both in London and in Massachusetts, mostly around the Boston area, and people came into the clinic. They had one day tested their blood sugar and blood fat after we gave them a very large breakfast and then a relatively smaller um, lunch. And then they went home and we put them a continuous glucose monitor and we gave them an app to record what they were eating, their level of hunger and different things. And so they went home, precisely very important how, what they were eating after that meal. So we gave them, you know, take these breakfast or take these different things um, for breakfast for a few days. And they recorded how hungry they felt. And we also know how high, how low went their glucose depending on what they were eating. And this, was, this is very large because most studies on measuring blood glucose particularly were measured either in diabetics, people who have issues with, the, with their blood sugar, or they are measured in relatively smaller uh, samples and not for 15 days at home and all of these um, different types of uh, uh, information like what are you eating? So what is- And Anna, how many, just to contrast, how many people were in this study and, and what, what's, what are sort of the study sizes that have been done historically? Well, particularly for measuring appetite um, after a meal or, you know, levels of glucose after a meal and how that relates to appetite, these studies tend to be very tightly controlled um, studies in 20, 40, 50 people at most. And then they follow them up. They give them one specific meal with a certain glycemic index, just an interruption there. A glycemic index is how high your sugar goes. Um, and then that, that's kind of what, and then another one with a low glycemic index. Whereas here we have a set of different meals for breakfast that we know exactly what they contain and then what they eat regularly during the day. If they want to have um, a glass of, uh, of soda or if they want to have a cup of tea with without sugar, if they want to have snacks, the chocolates, you name it, they can have anything during the day, their normal lunch, their normal dinner, and we know how their glucose goes up and how it goes down and how hungry they feel after that. And this was more than a thousand participants, right, Anna? It, that was uh, an over 1,100 participants overall that took part. So we are looking at something like 6,000 meals of the set type, the ones where we tell them exactly what they are eating. We actually give them the meal. We give them a muffin that has a specific uh, characteristics of how much fat and how much sugar it has. And then we also let them eat whatever they want. And we have 70,000 of the eat what you want the way you normally would. So it is very large compared to maybe comparing 40 people having the same type of meal and just measuring them after two hours. And this, this is to me, one of the most exciting things that's happening today in, you know, uh, 2021 with clinical research is that we used to be stuck in a challenging position in research where it, the choice was either a small group of people with a high level of detail among those people, or you had to make a compromise and say, well, I need more patients, I need more people. So we would do a very large group of people, but you would sacrifice the level of detail and the granularity. And now here we are, and we have 8,000 standardized meals, which are completely controlled and can be compared from one person to the next. We have over 70,000 meals total, total that have been registered into the app. We have continuous blood glucose monitor with all of the data that comes from that. And so this is really the best of both worlds merging together, which is high level of detail, granularity, and simultaneously a large number of people, a large number of data points. And so it's, it's quite exciting because what it means is that you can have greater confidence and the results that we're able to provide. Yeah, I think that, that, sorry, I was just to say that's a very good point because the large number of meals had also that some of these meals, they were taken by the same person twice. For instance, they took on Tuesday the, the meal that was high in carb and then they took it again on a Friday. 
I mean, or you know, whatever the day that would be. So we know actually whether the responses to these things were affected. Uh, if they, the same person taking the same meal, when for any fluctuation, maybe the amount of exercise or the amount of, of sleep, they had a bigger glucose dip, their glucose dropped after they had the meal. Uh, in one day, it dropped a bit more than another. Well, that actually correlates, even if they had the exact same meal, with how much hunger and how much they were willing to eat after that. So we know that even just taking these uh, identical settings that the results are validated. So that gives us very strong confidence in the results that we are presenting here. So that's brilliant, Anna. So you've got the biggest study in the world ever done looking at hunger. Um, you know, it sounds like, you know, 10 or 20 times bigger than before. And in these, uh, what, what I've learned, scientists like to call free living environment, which to the rest of us is normal life, not being locked up mm -hmm. in a clinic. But in scientific papers, you get, you call free living as if we're all chickens or something. Um, <laughs> tell us what, um, what you discovered. Give us the sort of headlines from, from the paper. So the big headline is that how low your glucose, your blood sugar drops in the two to four hours after you had a meal is going to determine how hungry you feel in those two to four hours and how much you're going to eat in the, say, three to 24 hours after that meal. And to put this in context, what we saw is that if we compare the people who had the smallest drops in glucose, no drop in glucose or just a tiny, teeny drop in glucose, to the ones that had the biggest ones, so the 25% the of our sample of our, of our participants who had the tiny drops to those who had the, the biggest drops, um, the difference in calories that they took that day for the same meal, uh, you know, they had the same amount of calories for that same meal then during the day, the ones with the big drops had ate 300 more calories during the day than the ones who had the smallest um, drops in glucose. So, and that is just because they felt a lot hungrier and so they ate during the day a lot more. So what we are finding, and this is something that has not really been explored before, is that your appetite, yes, we know that, that you know, people know, oh, you get a, a drop in glucose that might make you a bit hungrier, but how much does it determine it? You think, well, then I have lunch and I'm not gonna be that much hungrier. Well, it lasts 24 hours. Yeah, it's, it, it's quite, uh amazing to think about what's happening here, which th there's so much to sort of unpack and talk about. Um, satiety is a very important concept in today's world. We have an obesity epidemic. Uh, in the United States, they actually expect that it, it, by 2030, more than 50% of Americans will actually be obese, not overweight, obese. Wow. That five out of six Americans by that point will be overweight. And so satiety is perhaps the critical piece uh, because if you feel full, then you don't open up the refrigerator or the cupboard to get more food. I was gonna say, well, what is satiety is another one of these good science words. What does that mean? Satiety means the, it, it's like uh, the Rolling Stones, satisfaction. You got your satisfaction. So you've had <laughs> enough food to feel that you actually have enough and you can move on. So it's right? like the opposite and of being hungry. Is that what you're saying? Is that how we should think? The about opposite it? of being hungry, right? Yep. And that's really what that's really what Dr. Anna and her research team were looking at in this study is: can we look at fluctuations in the blood sugar and how they connect with this feeling of satisfaction or fullness after a meal, so that you don't have to go on and you know, many people have figured that, oh, it must be the rise in your blood sugar. But that's not true. It must be, oh, the glycemic index, which if you're going to get super nerdy, because I would imagine maybe there are some nerds listening to us right now, that's the area under the curve of the blood sugar. Is it the glycemic index, which is a very popular trend or idea in, in, in diet culture? That's not it either. The shocking part is that it's not the rise, it's the fall. The blood sugar goes up and then the blood sugar crashes down. And how far it crashes down determines how deep the fall is. And the deeper that it goes, what Dr. Anna and the team are showing here is that that indicates a higher probability of feeling hungry. And that feeling of hungry is going to drive you to overeat or increase your consumption 
during the course of the next 24 hours. And so Dr. Anna has pointed out to us that if you have this, the person, the, the, the group of people who had the biggest dip, the biggest drop in their blood sugar after a meal consumed on average an extra 300 calories in a day. 300 calories in a day, so you start to help us to help us to understand that. I think um, Anna, you were talking about this uh, earlier. What does that translate into? Like, if I do that all year, um, what does that mean for me? So, if you were like, if you were eating normally two thousand calories or two twenty five hundred calories, which is what like a uh, healthy young male or you know would eat every day, and you were adding an extra three hundred calories to that, that would add up to like. Uh, 20 pounds in a year, or if you cut out those 300 calories, that would be a loss of 20 pounds or 50 to 20 pounds in a year, just because of the amount of, you know, over a whole year that adds up to a ton. 300 calories in one day even means just losing um, the, the equivalent of 50 grams. So that is one tenth of a pound in one day, just for those 300 calories. Um, so, so to play that back, Anna, just to make sure we understand, you're saying that you can change what you eat potentially to some other food with exactly the same number of calories. And just by changing that, I'm gonna be less hungry over the next 24 hours. Therefore, I'm, I guess, gonna snack less, you know, eat less later on. Um, and as a result, it could make a difference of like 20 pounds worth of, uh, you know, weight change over the next year. Is that, is that really yes, what just, this paper just says? By, just by focusing on the meals that uh, by, what we found was is that the big, the meals that give you the biggest dips are not lunch and and dinner. The meals that give you the biggest dips are breakfast and snacks and drinks that you have during the day. So if you have a breakfast that is giving you a big dip, you're going to be hungry during the rest of the day, and you think, oh well, are you already over? No, they end up overcompensating by a ton, three hundred calories. You know, even. If, if, you, if, if people are dieting, they know that that's a considerable amount. And what we thought was very interesting is that not everyone had a big dip to every meal, uh, although most people have dips of some uh, amount, and different people have different dips for different meals. So what we are trying to understand now is what causes a person to dip more or less for a different meal and give them the perfect or the ideal advice for them to avoid those meals that give you the deep unless they're trying to gain weight and feel hungry during the day which I don't think is a great idea then um, th this gives us a strategy for targeting appetite so Anna I did this uh, I did this study and it turns out I'm one of these people who has a lot of um, uh, of big dips uh, and one of the things that, that came out of this was that um, so, different foods quite to my surprise have these very different results so can you explain a bit that for example one of my takeaways is now my whole family knows that i don't like to have any mashed potatoes uh mashed potatoes turn out to be really bad and um uh this is sometimes annoying because it's one of my son's favorite foods talk a bit about mashed potatoes versus you know rice which is the swap that i've discussed at home that you know that, that we've made I think that's awesome that you bring that example because that's exactly one of the, of the experiments, if you want, that we did. So we asked people to take mashed potatoes and, and white rice, and they have, on the varieties that we use, they had the same glycemic index. They go up the same. The glucose of the of people goes exactly the same. But the difference is that mashed potatoes, after it starts going down, it goes down, 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 big dips. Whereas white rice, it goes up exactly the same, same glycemic index, same um, peak in the sugar, but it goes down to where it was before they ate that. So the people who had the bowl of rice didn't end up hungry after, you know, two, three hours after they had had their, their rice, but the ones that had the mashed potatoes ended up eating a lot more. And this also happens between having uh, diet drinks or a very sugary drink. People who have a sugary drink, their glucose goes up. If they think this is going to keep them going for the next few hours and just, you know, have a high in sugar and that will give me the energy, it's exactly the opposite. It goes up and it has a very big down and this, unless it goes with another, with a meal or with something else. Whereas people who have just water or, or a diet drink, it stays stable and then they can stay, um, with, without hunger or control their, uh, their their appetite for longer. 
so yes, that's a brilliant swap. And that's one of the things that we're now trying to investigate, which meals are better to avoid the dips. And it, it's not the same because one of the things we have discovered in Zoe in terms of your glucose peaks, glucose dips, your gut microbes, you are a unique individual and uh, not everyone responds the same to every food. I think that's that's one of the big takeaways that people need to understand is that so one of the beauties of this study is that people were receiving the exact same meal. Yes. And we can compare from one person to another. And so let's just to kind of give an example to the people who are listening at home. Anna, if I eat the exact same meal as Jonathan, will I have the exact same dip or the exact same response? Not necessarily, and even Jonathan might have a different response on different days because other some of the other things that affect it is, um, of course, what he ate before. Clearly, you know, if if, if we're talking during the day, but also um, the amount of sleep. Sleep affects our sugar responses, and also the amount of exercise that he's been doing. So the same meal on different days might have different responses, and uh, that's one one of the beauties of these continuous glucose monitors and a, a regular app is that you know where you're at in terms of uh, your glucose responses. And this is this is one of the things that's I think quite shocking to people to hear is that you could feed the exact same food to two different people, they will have a completely different response. You could feed the exact same food as you just alluded to, you could feed the exact same food to the exact same person under different circumstances, different levels of sleep, different levels of exercise, different meals that predated that. Yeah. And they will have a different response. Dr. Anna you are involved in the Twins UK registry. There were identical twins that are genetically the same that were included in this study. Talk to us about, did they have the same response to the exact same food? Well, we didn't test that specifically for the deeps. We're working on that right now. But I can tell you, yes, if you, you're identical twin, like if you, if you have the same meal twice, it's more similar than you, you and another person having the same meal uh, you know, at the same day, because you, it's, it's yourself, your identical twin is going to be more similar to you than someone who's unrelated to you. But overall, what we found is that your genes explain only a tiny proportion of your glucose responses, definitely less than 10% of your glucose responses, whereas other things, the meal content, among others, is, are, are a lot more important in terms of explaining that. And so we think that's the same for the glucose dips. And one of the things that also we know affects glucose responses is your gut microbes. And again, that's one of the things we need to continue exploring and understanding how that's working with that. And that's that's one of the advantages of, of participation in the Zoe program it, for the consumer is that they get the, the personalized feedback because at the end of the day, we can create, you know, we can look statistically among a population to say, yes, among this population, this may be the food that is least likely to cause a dip. And this is the food that is most likely to cause a dip. But that is the population that does not explain the individual. And what is nice about Zoe is that through the combination of microbiome testing, continuous glucose monitor, the blood lipid testing, and also the food app, we're able to actually give that, that individualized feedback to a person so that they can understand better what their response is. Exactly. That's a super important point. Um, when we have been looking at this, you would you normally say, oh, if you are a woman under the age of 50 and then you are overweight this much, then this is going to be your response. And if you are a man over the age of 20 and then actually it's not like that. Those characteristics explain only a small proportion of people's responses and understanding your individual responses to specific meals is what's going to help you understand how how your sugar is going to go up your sugar and also one of the things we're looking zoe is um your blood fat but that's probably for another day but you're definitely you can understand your sugar a lot better using the zoe app than using something else okay so one of the things that really stood out for me in the paper that I wanted to talk to Dr. Anna about and hear what her thoughts are. We know that blood glucose is fuel for the brain. 
And one of the things that we found in this paper is that when a person has a dip, meaning that they are dropping their blood sugar below a normal level for them, we find that they have a decrease in alertness. Yes. That in essence, they, tr they have trouble focusing. And that actually is statistically correlated with an increase in their hunger at the same time. Do you think, do you, Dr. Anna, do you, do you think that this is more than just a coincidence that the... Oh, absolutely. That the, I mean, we, it was not a big part of this study, and there are other studies ongoing with Zoe looking specifically at alertness, but absolutely, because what your brain needs to work, and that's where we started, right? You need sugar in your brain. Your brain needs to, to, to work and to function. It needs sugar. And um, so your blood, your blood sugar goes down, less energy is going into your brain, and then people feel less alert. So not, it's not just about trying not to feel hungry. If you're trying to control your weight, maybe you are, you have an ideal BMI and you're super healthy that way. But then um, come the afternoon, you start stuffing your face with cookies because you're big, feeling sleepy. Well, you don't want that because those, um, or whatever, or sugary drink is just going to give you a spike, then another low and you're going to feel even um, less alert than you were before. So controlling your sugar is not just about controlling appetite, but also about controlling your levels of energy and alertness. Yeah, it seems it seems to me like when you eat a junky meal, you end up having this period of time a little bit later where you pay the price and you feel kind of miserable. And that's what we're seeing, the signal that we're starting to detect here in the paper. And it, it what's interesting to me is that it seems that we have um, adapted or evolved to have this protective mechanism where when our blood sugar dips, we actually can basically kick in our, our, our hunger cues to try to compensate and raise that blood sugar back up. And the problem is that that evolutionary mechanism that's meant to protect us is being exposed in the modern world because we have these hyperglycemic foods that are devoid of fiber and that basically are whipping our blood sugar, whipping it up and down, up and down. And as a result, we are suffering the consequence of fatigue and that, you know, fatigue and then increased hunger. And then, and ultimately where we end up is we end up with a metabolic problem because we're overeating. That's a sort yeah. of hamster wheel, isn't there here, Anna, where is I think what you're describing where you, which I think is how we've been taught. I was taught certainly younger, you know, you're hungry. My mom's like, well, you know, you need to give something that gives you a quick burst of sugar. I remember my grandmother always saying this. <laughs> so like, of course I would drink like a sugary drink. And what you're really saying in this is it pushes it out, right? So I feel better for a short period of time. Traditionally, we've only looked in this two hour period. It all looks looks good. Then you're saying, hey, if you go and look beyond that two hours and see what happens after that. I'm getting this big drop, I'm getting hungry, so then I'm back in this cycle, and I think that's the sort of vicious cycle that, that Will is, um, is talking about, right? Yeah, absolutely, that's exactly right. And if you think about it evolutionarily, that might have made sense, because people were not having a lot of sugar. I think it's it's not very common to have sugary foods in you know, what a hunter-gatherer would have been having meat or, you know, a vegetable, something like that, but definitely I would not be having uh, a donut with coffee with tons of sugar or, 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 or a sugary drink. So that is very new, even, even in, in uh, centuries past, that was not common. I think we live in a society that has too much sugar. And um, if, if for nothing else, if you want to stay alert and not keep feeling hungry, controlling that and understanding which meals are going to give you the smallest tips would be helpful. That's brilliant. So I'm conscious that uh, we're shooting through and I don't want to finish the, uh, this conversation without talking about what this means for calories. So really fascinating explanation of how blood sugar ties into hunger in a way that nobody understood before. But uh, I think we've all been taught, uh, you know, certainly since I was a small child, but long before that, that the most important thing about a food is how many calories it has. Right. That's the, what really determines uh, a food. And when you think about what you're supposed to do, the first advice is what you mentioned before. Oh, you know, you're a man or you're a woman. You have this level of activity. You should eat this many calories. Um, what does this research tell us about 
uh, how we should think about calories. If we people want to lose weight, is counting calories the right way to think about it? As we think about, you know, food, like what does this tell us about the, the calorie? Does it have any so what, what we showed here in the, in, the, in the preset meals, in the specified meals, is that we give people 500 calories for breakfast. So it's 500 calories, the same amount of calories. But the 500 calories that to a certain person give a glucose dip mean that they end up eating 100 or up to 300 more calories than someone else who had the exact same 500 calories in the morning. And then they were they they had achieved their satisfaction as as Dr. Will was just saying, and so they were happy. They had a, a a lot less calories during the day. So not all calories are created equal. You have a breakfast that doesn't give you a glucose dip that has the exact same amount of calories as, as another one. That's going to translate into a very different eating behavior during the day and also how you feel. So no, not not all calories are created equal. If you this if all you effect. were doing is like oh I did well because I ticked the box a few calories that's not true. And and Anna for you has this research uh, affected anything about the way that that you eat and think about calories? Oh absolutely I think I'm very conscious now of not having like oh I'm just gonna have uh, you know uh, some sugar on my tea in the afternoon or something or in the middle of the morning because now I know you know what that's more likely to make me hungrier during the day if I want to eat something I'm gonna eat something and uh, that that really fills me and and not these snacking things I think we were uh, up until recently there was this idea have five snacks a day or you know different diets come with different fashions but I think what, although it's not a, an, a particular emphasis of this study, what it shows is that it's snacking that gives you the biggest dips. So maybe be careful with that. Yeah, I felt like for me, one of the biggest takeaways from this study is I, I, I feel like you really nailed exactly the right way to describe it, Dr. Anna, which is to say that not all calories are created equal. And so it's not the calories have been invalidated, calories still matter, but it's not a matter of simply, you know, eating a certain number. And basically, you can you can choose your, you know, option of, on calories, choose the right calorie, and you will activate your satiety hormones, and you will energize yourself, and you won't have to compensate for it later. Or you can choose the wrong calorie, and your satiety mechanisms will fail. You will not be satisfied by your food. You will be hungry and desire to eat later and either be miserable and hungry or you will, uh, you will eat and end up overeating and, and stacking more calories into your life. And either way, when you choose the wrong calorie, what the study is also showing us is that you're going to zap your energy. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's, it's very clear that we want to opt for the right calories and, and what those are. Are unique to us as individuals and that's part of the value of doing the exploration with zoe to get the proper testing and identify what are the foods that are unique to you that are the right calories anna just uh, as we're sort of uh, coming towards the uh, the end portion of this I think we'd love to discuss what excites you for the future. So uh, you, you also said to me, like, this has been published. It's a, it's a, it's a great paper and a, and, a, and a fantastic journal. But you also said, hey, actually, just open up lots more questions. Tell us a little bit about that. And also, um, you know, what are the ongoing um, uh, studies that you have that are going to help you to answer those questions? So this was a study, as, as we just said, in 1,100 people, but now we have within Zoe a, a new PREDICT study. So PREDICT2, which is another 1,000 people, and PREDICT3, which is several thousands already. So we now have more power to investigate more things and to understand better what causes people to, and what causes specific individuals to have bigger or smaller dips, which foods for which people. And understanding that uh, would open us a, a huge door. Also, how, it, how is hunger related to, to your, um, yes, to your blood sugar, but maybe to other things? How is your blood, uh, your hunger related to your gut microbes? I think that's a fascinating question that we need to address because the, the more we understand about our gut microbes and our blood sugar, the more we investigate these things, the more we're understanding how much of our health is determined by what we eat. Um, you know, uh, you, 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 when you started uh, um, introducing me that I started with genetics, one of the things that made me switch from genetics to understanding nutrition is that 
um, genetics, yes, explain some of it. You cannot do anything about it. But actually what you eat makes a huge difference to your health, to how you feel, and where are you going to be 10 years from now, to how you age. And this so, is quite important, right, Anna, that we live in this world, I think, where you know, a lot of us have been sort of told you, you're stuck, right? Your genes are like your destiny. So there's mm -hmm. nothing you can do about it. You're stuck. It's like all your parents' fault, right? <laughs> Upbringing mm -hmm. and genes. And there's actually something really exciting, I think, about this and some of the other research that's come, come through, um, and both you and Tim and, and Will talk about this, like this ability to actually have a lot more control than you might realize. And I think also potentially to have, have impact relatively fast. Isn't that right? Like this is not a decade long thing to be able to make changes. No, absolutely. You can, and even your, well, clearly you can, you, we know that you can change your diet relatively quickly. It's changing the habits. Um, your gut microbes can change in a few weeks. You can have different gut microbes who are functioning differently and giving you a healthier outcome for all kinds of things, not just for hunger or weight loss. Well, any thoughts from you about, you know, the, the future directions this can take us? Um, I think that we, so, there were so many things that jumped out to me from this paper. Um, one of the big things to me was I felt like this is bye bye to the concept of the glycemic index. Um, it's a very sort of popular dietary approach that people use. But you know, to know that two people can eat the same food and have a totally different response, that identical twins can eat the same food and have a different response, that one individual can eat the same food and have a different response. Um, the glycemic index can be a general measure, but in this study, it didn't actually correlate with changes in hunger. So it was the decline, it was the dip. And this is just to, just to remind, Anna mentioned it earlier, right? That the glycemic index is basically measuring the sort of the rise over the first two hours and then stops. So it's a zero to two hours. And what Anna's saying is sort of all the most interesting things are actually happening after two hours. Anna, is that a... That's that correct. And right? in fact, we didn't find any. So, I mean, if you wanted to predict your levels of hunger or your levels of calorie intake from uh, the glycemic index of the meal, we didn't find anything uh, relevant there. The deep is what matters. So following your glucose beyond the two hours is important. And that is one of the reasons why you would want to have a CGM and not just be counting the glycemic index like you would be counting calories for a meal because that's not going to be terribly informative. So people, so people who are guiding their choices, particularly if their goal is weight loss and they're using the glycemic index to guide those choices, we now see from this study alone that that's not going to lead you to a place of success uh, or is unlikely to. So, um, so I think, you know, that's one of the big takeaways for me from this study. And, you know, in terms of, in terms of the future, uh, I think that this, what I love about what's happening is that we have the perfect storm of fantastic clinical research like this coming together from a large data set with a high level of detail that allows us to take a deep dive with populations but into individuals, and then we can relay those findings on to people on an individual basis so that for literally the first time in human history, you have the ability to understand everything that's so complicated, how it affects you in a simple way on an individual basis so that you know exactly what foods to eat, whether your goal is to optimize for weight loss, to get satisfaction from meals, to control your blood sugar, to optimize your microbiome. It's literally all there. I think that's a fantastic point to stop. I know we could actually keep talking about this for another two hours uh, and we may well come back to blood sugar. It's such an important uh, topic, but for today, uh, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, Anna, Will, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your days to, to share this with us. Uh, I think just, uh, you know, in, in final wrap up, if, if you want to discover your own blood, blood sugar responses, then do come to, to the Zoe website. Uh, if you go to join Zoe, J-O-I-N-Z-O-E dot com forward slash podcast, uh, then actually you can uh, sign up. Uh, we're currently on sale in the US with a wait list uh, and launching in the UK later this year, uh, and we hope in other countries uh, subsequently. If you'd like to learn more about the science that we've discussed today, uh, we'll put the link to the full scientific paper uh, in the notes uh, and uh, 
for our more adventurous listeners, uh, then obviously you can get really deep into the science there. And also uh, some links onto the Zoe website, uh, which I think are a really good uh, middle ground to also explore more of the science, both about blood sugar and also a number of the other topics uh, we've talked about. Uh, the plan is to explore some more uh, on blood sugar in the future, but also other aspects of nutritional science, uh, a lot of course on uh, microbiome and gut health. So do subscribe if this sounds interesting and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.